Welcome to A Moment of Zen. Time to sit back and relax as model, actress, mentor, and supermom Zen Sams takes you on a sexy and wild ride, covering the latest in film, fashion, pop culture, cryptocurrency, fintech, cannabis, and entertainment from the millennial mom's perspective. Here's your host, Zen Sams. Hello, my beautiful friends and loyal listeners. It's always a pleasure to spend my time with you on the airwaves. Thank you for listening and interacting with me on social media. That truly makes it all worthwhile. Please make sure to follow me at Zen Sams. That's Zen with an X, not a Z. And remember that we're now on TV. Tune in at impact.kpmedia.tv and catch a moment of Zen on the Impact live channel Sundays at 11 a.m. Eastern. All episodes are now available on demand. We have such a great show lined up for you today. In our influencer segment brought to you by CCP Digital, we are featuring Laura Mikatesh. She goes by the Iron Giantess. She is a mega influencer, a transformation specialist, a nutritionist, and a bodybuilding trainer. And at six foot one and 320 pounds from obese, At just 22 years old, she is now the epitome of health just a few years later. We're going to chat obesity, weight loss, how she did it, and all you need to know to stay healthy and fit. And in our business and buzz segment, we have returning contributor, Kyle Wool, president of Revere Securities, joined by our really good friend, Andrew Giuliani, who is in the running to become the 58th governor of the state of New York. And today, Kyle, Andrew, and I are chatting about the political climate, our economy, and how it's affecting New Yorkers' bottom line. In my digital world segment brought to you by Tempest Network, we have returning contributor Shahal Khan, CEO of Burkan World and Tempest. And today he is joined by physicist Nassim Haramain, CEO and executive director of research and development at Taurus Tech. Today, we are chatting about the energy efficiency renewables industry and the technologies propelling the future as we look under the hood of energy efficiency at the juncture of blockchain technology. In our innovation and tech segment brought to you by Caldwell Soames, we have returning contributor Paul Caldwell, chairman and CEO of Caldwell Soames. And today we are chatting with Vita Ridgway. She's co-founder of culturetech.io, a website that serves as the place where tech meets culture, an intersection of crypto, the metaverse, NFTs, blockchain, fintech, and all things web 3.0 for the creator economy. And today we are chatting about fintech's social impact, cryptocurrency, and tokenization. Stay tuned. We'll be back with the influencer segment brought to us by CCP Digital with the Iron Giantess, Laura Mikatesh. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by CCP Digital, bringing you a view from inside blockchain, cryptocurrency, and NFTs. Introducing the latest blockchain hero series, Retro Rebellion NFT Collectible Card Packs from the Nifty Company, available January 2022. Find out more online at ccpdigital.com. Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Coming on in just a few, we have our influencer segment brought to you by CCP Digital. And today we are featuring Laura Mikatesh, otherwise known as the Iron Giantess. Now, she, at 22 years old, had a very unhealthy relationship with food, and that left her weighing over 300 pounds, clinically obese and teetering on the edge of pre-diabetes. Laura knew that she was staring down a road of medications and disorders for the rest of her life. So she committed to making a change. And since 2014, Laura has lost over 130 pounds and gained a new perspective on life and nutrition. She's become a fitness and nutrition expert, passionate about health and wellness, and now works with others to strengthen their mind, body, and soul. As a child, Laura was given that name, Iron Giantess, that she still holds to today. She was taller and bigger than her peers. Her low self-esteem, though, manifested in binge eating, leading her weighing 320 pounds at her heaviest. Once she realized she needed to make a change, she started doing workouts at home, following videos she found on YouTube. She walked across campus, signed up for college gym, and fell in love with bodybuilding. While she expected to find the gym environment intimidating, she was pleasantly surprised to learn that at six foot one and 320 pounds, 
she was actually incredibly strong. And over the course of the first year, she lost 100 pounds and she now maintains her weight at approximately 180 pounds. And after losing the weight and discovering this passion for fitness, Laura decided to pursue this as a full-time career. She now uses her own experiences to help others and help people set and achieve their own health and fitness goals. Here to chat, Laura Mikitesh. Wow, what a journey. Welcome to the show, superstar. Hi, Zen. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. I'm so excited. Okay, let's dive right in because you are the perfect person to talk uh, to the world about this. So from intermittent fasting to keto, this dieting world is saturated with new methods and programs uh, and overnight solutions, you know, pop up promising the world and then some uh, with a never ending supply of information. It's really easy to understand that many of us are confused, frustrated, and just downright fed up with what to do. And with everybody and their mother touting the next great you know, breakthrough on how to lose fat or gain muscle. It's easy to get lost um, and drown in the sea of misinformation. What is your advice here? Here is almost everything is what I call the vacation diet. So everything crazy and cool that sounds sparkly and new is probably BS. You are best off moving your body a little bit more than you already do, eating, making slightly better choices than you already do, getting some water and treating yourself a heck of a lot better than you do. Stress, and sleep are gonna be two of your worst, your worst, worst, worst when it comes to your body and your health and your mind. So really the basics are where it's at and you're talking to somebody who was a middle school teacher. So taking all of the information that is being thrown in your face and breaking it down to the bare minimum, that's my deal. You can get a lot healthier doing a little bit more for a lot longer than you can rushing and stuff. Very true. Wise words. That's why you do what you do. Uh, now, if, if you want to gain muscle or lose fat, right, the old um, adage of calories in and calories out still holds true. If you want to gain muscle, start simple. Eat about, I think it's 500 calories over maintenance level. Eat around one gram of protein per pound of body weight and about two or more grams of complex carbs per pound of body weight. So keep, keep healthy fats a bit on the low side since each gram of fat has over twice the amount of calories as protein or carbs. And these are kind of the basic things that you know people could do a Google search on and read. But when you look at fasting, right, if your goal is to gain muscle, fasting for the majority of the day, I feel just won't work because you need to eat several times a day to get in a consistent dose of protein protein and make sure you're a bit, you know, over maintenance regarding your calories. Um, you don't, you know, you can't underfeed your gym efforts, so to speak, is what my trainer says. Um, what are your thoughts if, if you don't want to gain muscle, but rather lose weight, is intermittent fasting recommended? So I think the biggest word that you just said there is lose weight. So it really is about whether you're trying to lose weight or you're trying to lose fat, because that added muscle and really staying um, consistent in the gym, pushing and adding muscle there is going to help you specifically target fat burning. So you're going to see muscle composition change, body composition change. You're going to see those athletes that you see that are lean and strong and have lots of muscle striation and things like that. They're going to be eating their food still. Typically we see, especially with women in this society, a chronic under eating. And then what that leads to is the body pushing our brains to crave instant food, instant satisfaction, which is going to be sugar. So that's why you see a lot of women falling into binge eating habits. They think they're fasting. They go throughout the day. They're not providing enough nutrients throughout the day to their body. And their body is then sending those biochemical signals to crave carbohydrates at the end of the night. And that's why somebody who has fasted all day and thought they were really on track ends up with a bag of chocolate covered pretzels in their lap when they're watching their Grey's Anatomy episodes. So Fasting can work and every body is different. There is absolutely no science. Dr. Huberman says there's no science to truly prove exactly what your specific body is going to respond to best. But if you're finding at the end of the day that you are absolutely starving and when you go to break your fast, you're picking foods that you know are counterintuitive to your health or they're counterintuitive to your goals. Fasting is not working for you. You are much better off adding foods in, especially ladies, if you're going to fast, one of my biggest recommendations is try fasting by eating in the morning. And I know you don't like it. And I know you don't want to go all day feeling full. But if you're going to eat in the morning, that's going to tell you a lot about your hunger cycles. It's going to tell you whether your body actually enjoys fasting. Because if you can fast and eat your breakfast, go till noon, and then you're not hungry throughout the day, maybe your body responds to fasting. But if you spend the rest of the day wanting to nosh on something, it's probably not for you. There you go. Wow. 
so much advice. You, you really pack it in there. Okay, we have about a minute and a half left, and I want to shift to obesity because the numbers are staggering according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Two out of every five adult Americans are obese. To put this into perspective, uh, Laura, a five foot nine male weighing 203 pounds or a five foot six woman weighing 186 pounds has a body mass in this in a body mass index in excess of 30 and they are considered obese. So 40% of us exceed this threshold and two out of, and you know, the, these statistics are kind of creeping up. So if you have to go back and look at obesity increases the risk of getting cancer, um, 13 different cancers, including breast, pancreas, thyroid, and liver are all linked to obesity. What should people be cutting out of their diet, even as a simple guideline, less than a minute? Sedentary lifestyles. That's my number one recommendation. Get your butt up, start moving, start walking. I know you had a long day at work, but you were probably sitting down. You've got to be moving. Even if you're incorporating 10 minute walks every few hours throughout your workday, that is going to change your life. Add activity. If I had to say anything else that you need to cut out, you do not have to exclusively remove anything from your diet forever, but try to minimize the amount of really, you know, the foods you don't want to be eating, increase your vegetables, increase your fruit, increase your wonderful protein content and move your butt. Wow. You're the best. Thank you so much for coming on. I loved having you on. We're out of time, but wow, I'm going to definitely check out all your stuff. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. having me. Definitely check out Laura Mikatesh on the gram at the Iron Giantess. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Revere Securities. Revere is committed to building a relationship of trust in which they work closely with you to help you define your objectives, explore alternatives, and choose the financial and investment strategies that are most appropriate for you. Go to reveresecurities.com. Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. I am your host, Zen Sands. Up next in our business and buzz segment brought to us by Revere Securities, we have returning contributor Kyle Wool, president of Revere Securities. And today he is joined by our good friend, Andrew Giuliani, who is in the running to become the 58th governor of the state of New York and son to former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani. Now, basically, the way I see it in this Republican primary, it's a toss up between Long Island Rep Lee Zeldin and Andrew Giuliani. Now, despite Lee Zeldin's very big fundraising and endorsement advantage, Andrew Giuliani is more popular in New York City and upstate by far in the lead within those two regions. And today, Kyle, Andrew, and I are chatting about the political climate, our economy, and how it's affecting New Yorkers' bottom line. Now, inflation has led to sharp increases in everyday goods. Groceries and gas now cost a lot more. And in New York, a high-cost state to begin with, pain from inflation and high gas prices can be felt almost everywhere. But as the state lawmakers negotiate a state budget due at the end of this very month, there are bipartisan calls for trying to find ways of easing price burdens on consumers and taking less of a bite out of their wallets. And here to chat some more are Kyle Wool and Andrew Giuliani. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Jen, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yes, thanks again, Zen. So nice to have you both on. Okay, um, Andrew, I'm going to start with you. Let's chat uh, gas pains. Okay, the per gallon uh, the per gallon price of gasoline has remained steadily over four dollars in most parts of New York State over the last several weeks. Of course, compounded by the war in Ukraine, and as a result, lawmakers are considering a suspension of the gas tax in New York that will take us through the end of the year. And additional proposals have also included capping the price of the gas tax in New York. And in fact, the state collects about $2 billion in gas taxes each year. And New Yorkers on average, Andrew, are paying about 48 cents per gallon at the pump. How realistic is the suspension of the gas tax? And is this enough, Andrew? I think it's very realistic. I think it's for the wrong reason. I think it's good. First and foremost, let me say, I am supportive of suspending the gas tax. It's the right thing to do. I'm glad they're doing it. And I, I think, honestly, it's something we should look at potentially suspending further just past an election year. Unfortunately, the reason why they're doing it is because all of these Democratic Assembly members, all of these Democratic state senators, and yes, Kathy Hochul herself have an election coming up. And guess what? On November 7th, when people fill up their tank, so that way they have enough gas to go to the polls on November 8th, 
all these Democrats want to make sure that they're not going to have over five dollars a gallon. Well, the truth is they might have over five dollars a gallon, whether or not the gas tax is suspended or not. I just drove back from Buffalo the other day and we were at four dollars and eighty nine cents where we ended up filling up. I think our total gas price for our, to fill up our truck was almost one hundred and fifty dollars, one hundred and forty seven dollars. This is amazing. I mean, you think about this and for our campaign, it's costs a lot. But I think about the New Yorkers all around the state that might be making fifty, fifty five thousand dollars. Now, imagine just how much gas has gone up since oh, yeah. President Trump left office and how much weekly from a weekly standpoint the expenses are. I mean, it has to be another four or five percent uh, of the of their expenditures that they are spending now that they were not spending two years ago. I completely echo your sentiment because at this point right now, yeah, people are going to the pumps and they're making decisions on how much gas am I going to actually put in my car? Food is expensive. All costs are up. It's crazy. Let's move to Kyle because we have about four minutes and I want to get Kyle's thoughts here on the property taxes. Kyle, New Yorkers pay some of the highest property taxes in the country. Um, the state the state a decade ago sought to cap annual increases by local taxing districts like municipalities and school districts. But lawmakers now believe high property taxes have made it more difficult for people to remain in New York. What do you say to this? I think it's a big problem. I think when you look at some of, some of the people in my industry, in the financial service industry, you're seeing a mass exodus and a diaspora down to low tax states, especially Florida. You're also seeing some people from California, very similar, moving to Texas. And I think that will continue to drive out New Yorkers. Also, when you look at people like myself that are Manhattan residents, we start to look at not only the federal tax, the state tax and the city tax, we're paying well over 50 percent. And then you look at the defunding of the police department. What are we really getting for our taxes that we're paying in? Now, finally, Broadway is reopening, which is great. Museums are open again. You're starting to have some charity events, which is wonderful. Well, are the subways safe? Is the police department defending us for the amount of money that we pay? And I think it's a big issue that needs to be addressed. Without a doubt. And and that issue is is not going to get addressed unless we have the right um, lawmakers, policymakers and the right leaders up there. Uh, and right now there is a great lack of that. And you let's move on. We have there are also calls for pay raises for this uh, for, for low income workers, including people who work in the home care sector. Home care workers have gone years with what supporters say should be considered a cost of living adjustment. And lawmakers in both the state Senate and Assembly have embraced the pay raise for those workers seen as a needed retention tool for a sector that has lost workers to other fields during the pandemic. What are your thoughts on this? You have about a minute and a half. So I think government mandated pay raises is one of the reasons why people are leaving New York, unfortunately. I think the free market determines this better than the government can. I'd much rather have people that sign the front of the checks rather than the back of the checks actually determine whether or not uh, whether or not they're getting pay raises or not. Because simply again, and I'm sure Kyle can speak to this even better than I can, the market determines this so well. And talking about property tax which is one of the things, one of the proposals that I have out there starting on day one is making sure from an education state standpoint that parents have tax vouchers. So then that way, if they don't like the way their public school is performing, they can take those tax dollars and go to a parochial, a private yeshiva, a homeschool. We need to have more options. And as so many New Yorkers know, we're one of the highest tax property tax states in the country, depending on which county you are. Westchester is certainly, I think, leading the country in it. Um, I want to make sure that New York parents have those dollars in hand, because then what does that do? That actually creates the free market in education. Then you're going to get better educational services for our kids. I actually believe that parents are the primary stakeholders in their kids' education. I know a lot of Democrats don't, but that's my belief. Kyle, let's talk about the efforts here that the political parties are both trying to make to ease the, the burden on New Yorkers. So a lot of it um, and a lot of these efforts are blurring political party lines when it comes to tax policy. And in my opinion, at least in many cases, Democrats are joining Republicans in supporting permanently lower taxes or temporary cuts in including for high earners, right? But while the policies are aimed at helping Americans weather the fastest pace of inflation in like 40 years, economists warn that paradoxically, cutting taxes could exasperate the very problem lawmakers are trying to address. By putting more money in people's pockets, policymakers risks further stimulating already rampant consumer demands, pushing prices even higher nationally. What do you say to this? I think at the end of the day, the free market should dictate. And I do think a lower tax policy and giving small business owners more money to go out and grow their business, 
to put people to work, to hire people, which in turn puts more people in the workforce. I think that's the real solution to all of our problems. But at the same time, I do think, and not to get political, when you do look at some of our leaders on the Democratic side, like Chuck Schumer, who is one of the senior senators in the United States Senate, why is he not, as a Democrat, looking at his own state, the state of New York, and repealing the SALT tax? The SALT tax is one of the biggest issues we have that the Democrats, you would think, would be pushing that through. If they could repeal that, I think it would be a huge stimulus to a lot of New Yorkers, and maybe you wouldn't have that exodus from New Yorkers moving to states like Florida. Well said. Couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And I know, uh, Andrew, I know you, you're just dying to pipe in here. Yeah, I know. I know. I can't keep my mouth shut over here. It's a politician <laughs> problem. But no, the truth is, I think exactly what Kyle said. Look, New York last year led the country in out-migration. And Kyle touched on this in the last segment. It's, segment. it's not just because we are one of the least economic-friendly states in the country. It's also because crime is spiraling out of control, right? We're seeing the issue with teachers and education. That's another issue right there. We're seeing some of the mandates that people have decided to leave because of that. But I think when looking in New York, and especially if you live specifically in New York City, uh, if you're a high-tax earner, the government actually is the senior partner in your relationship. And it's exactly what I think more and more New Yorkers are deciding. And normally, this is a decision that New Yorkers would decide in their 60s or 70s. You're seeing it now for people in their 30s and 40s that are saying, you know what? Um, what am I getting for paying the bulk of my income to the government? What services am I getting for it? And the answer is not enough. And that's why you have more New Yorkers saying, well, Florida sounds good. Texas sounds good. Tennessee sounds good. I don't think that should be a choice that New Yorkers have to make. That's why, for me, I think it's so important that we cut taxes and also cut regulation. That's a day one priority for a Giuliani administration. And the good thing about cutting regulation is a lot of that comes out of the executive branch. So that's not a sit down that you have to have with the state Senate and the state assembly like taxes is, which is going to be a battle that we're going to win, but it's definitely going to be a battle where we're going to crack some skulls in the meantime. Truth is, we need to make sure we reduce regulation so New York is a business-friendly state, just like Florida, just like Texas, just like Tennessee, not like California or Venezuela even. Yeah, you said it. You said it. And, you know, when it comes to cutting taxes, it feels like the incentives for states don't always appear to be aligned with what is best for the national economy. And that's where I, I'm really irked, because when I'm voting for representatives, when I'm voting to, to place leaders in power, I want to know that they're understanding our issues on a national level and how they're local decisions are going to affect the nation as a whole. So I, I completely echo all your sentiments. Um, now we're going to move on to the fall of Roe. And although this is, is, is not one of Kyle's specialties, I do, I do want to hear his opinion on this. So in 2019, and just to clear the air, guys, New York lawmakers codified Roe's protections into the state law, passing the Reproductive Health Act, which was signed into law by former Governor Andrew Cuomo. So even if Roe is overturned, abortion will remain legal in the Empire State as a result of this codification. But now you have Rep. Lee Zeldin, okay? He actually said that he would appoint a pro-life health commissioner if he were elected governor. This kind of feels counterintuitive. I'll let you go first, Andrew. What do you say to this? So I would say, and then he walked back those comments a few days later, which I know the New York Post and a few other uh, news outlets covered uh, exactly. So I But think he said it. Uh, he said it, and then he walked him back, so I don't really know where he's standing. I know he's trying to play both sides of the fence on this. Look, I'll tell you, I'm a new father uh, of, of a five-and-a-half-month-old daughter, and I have to tell you, the first time that I saw her on the ultrasound, I knew the most important thing in my life, the most important mission of my life, was protecting her and protecting her welfare. Now, you mentioned the, the Reprodu Reproductive Health Act that was signed in New York in 2019. Uh, the thing that really bothered me about that specifically was the celebration of late-term abortions. Uh, I think when we're talking about abortions at 39 weeks, um, it horrifies me. It horrifies me to think of crushing a, a baby skull that can live on its own like that. Uh, and I remember that day when they lit up the Empire State Building and the call was to celebrate your abortion. That to me is horrifying, and I think you, lo you lose a little bit of morality in a society there. 
Um, so to me, that's something that I would fight against, specifically late term abortion, because I think uh, I think there are very few excuses for that. And to me, like I said, as a new father, um, I would want to do everything that I can to help and protect New York's most vulnerable. I agree. Uh, and I do. I echo that sentiment as a mom as well. I think there's a, a point in time and a case for everything. And I don't think um, when you have statements like uh, made from uh, Nebraska representatives, I'm going to leave them nameless, that they support, um, uh, you know, pro-life, even in the case of incest or rape. For me, that's a violation of, of women's rights. And so I do think that there has to be a fine medium between the two. Kyle, what are your thoughts? Well, it wasn't really the question I was looking, um, was expecting today to be commenting on Roe v. Wade. But I do think if um, it's a state's right issue, and I think people can decide where they want to live, if they want to live in a state that has more restrictive, that they can make that decision. I would also look across the pond at some of our friends in Europe, especially Germany, Spain, France, and they've pretty much as a society come together as a consensus that late term abortion is an issue. And whether it's 16 weeks, 20 weeks, 22 weeks, I think that should be decided on a state's right, a state's issue, but also maybe as a society, we should probably look at that too, because I echo Andrew's words, 36 weeks, 39 weeks, doesn't seem quite right to me. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, th these are average New Yorkers responding to average questions and where you're asking people what feels right and doesn't feel right. And here you have policymakers taking these rights, manipulating them to their advantage, to their political advantage. And that's where you lose me because this shouldn't even be a political choice. This this is not, this is a human rights choice with certain restrictions that I do think need to be added and, and modified. Uh, well, listen, we're out of time here. Kyle, thank you so much for piping in. Andrew, always a pleasure having you on. Wish you all the best. And I know you're ahead of the game, buddy. You, you got this. <laughs> Zen, Kyle, it's great to be with you guys. I got to tell you, very excited for the upcoming debates that we have coming up and get out there and vote. June 28th for Andrew Giuliani. You got it. We will. I sure will be doing it. And I know Kyle will too. That was our business and buzz segment brought to you by Revere Securities. That was president of Revere Securities, Kyle Will and Andrew Giuliani. Make sure you head to Andrew's website, New York for Giuliani.com and head to RevereSecurities.com. You're listening to a moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Tempus, the next generation of the engagement economy, allowing people to make money on their data and earn cryptocurrency for the time they spend on things they already currently love to do. With Tempus, brands will have the ability to pay you directly for interacting with apps, watching videos, playing games, and more. Tempus, the time is now. Engage and earn. Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Now, welcoming back to my digital world segment brought to you by Tempest Network, a Burkan world project. We are featuring a regular contributor, CEO of Tempest Network and founder, Shahal Khan. Today, he is joined by physicist and dear friend, Nassim Haramein, who spent more than 30 years researching and discovering connection in physics, cosmology, quantum mechanics, as well as anthropology. Currently, he serves as the CEO and executive director of research and development at Taurus Tech and applies his physics theories to patented technologies that focus on quantum vacuum energy extraction and gravitational effects. Well, we'll have to ask him about that one. Today, we're chatting about energy efficiency, renewables, and the technologies propelling the future. Now, as we look under the hood of energy efficiency at the juncture of blockchain technology, let's have an overview. Now, the market for energy efficiency is estimated at $360 billion a year and bigger than renewables. Energy efficiency is big business and plays a large and valuable role in the sustainable development of the global economy. It represents the most important plank in efforts to decarbonize the global energy system and achieve the world's climate objectives. With a $250 billion market, the efficiency sector has twice the potential potential of even renewable energy investments. It's still it's in its inception phase and therefore allows for infinite opportunities. And coming into Web 3.0, 
when you look at, for instance, the environmental impact of cryptocurrency mining, we see that has been wildly questioned in recent months, of course, as the sector continues to grow exponentially despite market fluctuations. Now, mining requires high powered computers capable of solving complex mathem mathematical equations. And according to experts at the University of Cambridge, global Bitcoin mining operations now consume more energy annually than Norway and Ukraine combined. And here to chat some more and break it all down are Shahal and Nassim. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Thank you, Zan. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great to have you on. All right, Nassim, let's start with you. In 2014, you launched the Resonance Academy, a unified physics online learning platform educating thousands of students from more than 80 countries. And then the Connected Universe, a feature length documentary film released in 2016, narrated by Sir Patrick Stewart, was produced based on your discoveries and their potential impact on generations to come. Talk to me about your mission and how this is going to be solving real world issues. Well, um, in, um, in physics, well, first of all, understanding the world is critical to developing technology, meaning technology emerged from really high level understanding of the physicality of our existence, the world as we see it and experience it. And from there, these technology instruct us on how to develop technology that eventually allows us to fly in the sky and have planes and rockets and all kinds of things, including uh, how to produce energy. For instance, fundamental theories told us that there was a lot of energy in the nuclear of atoms and we eventually got nuclear power out of it. But um, there is an evolution in scientific knowledge that is required at this time. And this evolution in physics is a unification of quantum theory and relativity theory. That is the theory for the big stuff and the theory for the small stuff has to come together. And as they do, and this is what I work on. And so as they do, as we find how to li link these two things, because obviously big things are made out of small things, so there must be a link. There is very straight engineering path that are developing that shows us a way in which we could extract significant amount of energy directly from the quantum field, directly from the structure of space-time at the quantum level. And what I mean by that is that at the quantum level, space is not empty, it's full of energy, and it could become available to us very, very shortly. Very interesting. So it seems like you have a technology roadmap, which will help create an increasing understanding about a, a rather complex ecosystem. And those are, in fact, uh, real world problems uh, that you are indeed could be solving, you know, with real world issues. So Shahal, let's aim to merge the two, shall we? By, commoditize, by commoditizing energy inadvertently, you can create a new tradable asset class in the commodities market. So I love it. And this is a really nice parallel to Burkan World's Enercap. Uh, project, which I want to hear more of, uh, because when you look at Enercap and their super star, supercharged storage, this is non-chemical, long life, faster charging, non-degrading, fully recyclable and biodegradable energy storage that we are talking about now. We know that energy use by the Bitcoin network in the United States and globally could grow significantly in the next five years, adding many gigawatts of demand. So with concerns increasing about utilities, carbon footprints, there is a growing push within the cryptocurrency industry to reimagine crypto mining systems as potential grid assets that can help balance demand and encourage renewable energy. How can Enercap revolutionize this? Yeah, Zen. So, you know, um, this uh, company that we uh, have invested in is made out of graphene uh, uh, storage. It's basically a, a storage. Um, I don't want to call it a battery, but it's a storage system. So um, it could take essentially power from any source. Um, you know, uh, we prefer renewable, for example, but it could take it directly from, let's say, today's fossil fuel based grid systems uh, at, uh, you know, when the tariffs are low and charge up these storage systems and, you know, allow um, the grid to have uh, balanced uh, energy. But I'm more interested in taking a system like Nassim's, uh, for example, in the future that could generate masses of power 
But the problem in the world is, you know, the world isn't built out evenly. And there are huge uh, places of um, non-grid presence in the world. So if you take uh, systems like Nassim system, and then we you know, power up our batteries, and let's say the batteries go out uh, into places that don't have grids, we could power, for example, a decentralized um, economy. I mean, we could power Africa, for example, by having certain places in Africa, for example, that produce the energy, uh, charge up our batteries, and we could deliver our batteries autonomously with trucks, for example. Um, and we could create, you know, create an off-grid system like this around the world, where essentially the energy cost is so low due to the fact that it's being taken out of, you know, the quantum field, let's say, to the uh, Nassim system and stored in our batteries, and then our batteries are actually transported around. In terms of, you know, the high cost of computing use of this energy, we are looking at a world that's going to become highly computerized, um, you know, with all the aspects of uh, Web3 and so on. And um, we can't, you know, rely on, um, let's say, inefficient uh, uh, places of generation, like sometimes even solar power and wind power um, are very difficult and still very expensive um, to, to, to generate that, you know, and, and, and they're specifically only in certain areas. We're going to need to power, you know, um, tera, you know tera, terabytes or, 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 or masses of gigawatts worth of power in the future. And they're still, other than nuclear, um, you know, there isn't any efficient way to generate that much power. And uh, a system like this seems possible can, you know, give us that amount of power uh, efficiently and cost effectively. And that's what we're really excited about. And that's what it's about, changing the world. And Nassim, with your technology, it's quite interesting because it does relate to some big relevant news. And I, I'd like I'd love your commentary on this. So an interesting parallel is the Oman plant construction, which is scheduled to start in the year 2028 in al uh governor rate on the Arabian Sea. And Oman is planning to build one of the largest green hydrogen plants in the world in a move to make the oil producing nation a leader in renewable energy technology. And it's going to be built in stages with the aim to be at full capacity by the year 2038, powered by 25 gigawatts of wind and solar energy. And the consortium of companies behind this $30 billion project includes the state-owned oil and gas company OQ, the Hong Kong-based renewable hydrogen developer Intercontinental Energy, and the Kuwait-based energy investor Enertech. Where are we heading here, and does this pave the way and set precedents in the renewables industry? Well, there's a few there's a few issues, and I think what Charles is uh, addressing is that um, both there's a need for uh, decentralizing power. So these projects are really uh, exciting and interesting. Uh, however, they they fail at decentralizing power, and one of the reason we must decentralize power is that the grid system is very vulnerable. Uh, it's vulnerable to various um, uh, things, one of them being uh, changes in solar activity. Uh, one solar flare directed at the earth at the right time, at the right moment, can wipe out a whole portion of the grid structure that we have in place on the planet. And uh, that could be uh, disastrous. Uh, this would not happen in a decentralized power system where, um, you know, every community or every house is even uh, have their own power so uh, system or where the power systems for cars is inside the car as well and so on. And so this is uh, this is really important as well as we increase, you know, now the the need for electrical vehicle is going through the roof. Um, you know, especially with the price of oil currently, a lot of people are switching to electric cars and so on. This is a huge demand on the grid system that will not be sustainable in a short amount of time. And so there is really a need to develop this uh, new level of technology, which extracts power directly from the structure of space, from the structure of the quantum space, wherever it's located. And that uh, that amount of power is is very vast. 
Uh, this is this this could revolutionize uh, a whole bunch of industries because this could be applied to a lot more than just one specific area, uh, especially when you're looking to change the world. Um, Shahal, I, we have about one minute left before we continue on after the commercial break, but I'm going to look at the glass half full here. So in the face of, gr of growing climate concern and potential regulations, miners say they've been consuming consuming a cleaner mix of energy and working with utilities and grid operators to provide needed demand flexibility. And the industry also touts its ability to spur the development of renewable energy, consume otherwise curtailed energy, and even help revitalize some of the country's aging hydropower assets. Now, from a public policy perspective, the most relevant question should be energy production rather than energy consumption. And Bitcoin mining in 2021 used about 58% sustainable energy and was sourced from a cleaner energy mix than the bulk of U.S. electricity. In your point of view, how can energy become an actual commodity with asset value rather than an economical expense? What do you say to this? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, um, as long as people have the capability to purchase the energy from a source or take energy generation and sell it to each other, disintermediating, let's say, the government or utilities, it becomes an asset value. So, for example, let's say, um, you know, on a private level, we're able to put highly efficient plants that have low, let's say, any generation energy generation costs and sell it directly through, let's say, a blockchain tokenized system where every ounce of that energy is saved into batteries like the batteries we have. So let's say Nassim's uh, plant is generating from his technology a gigawatt worth of power and we're able to save that in batteries and then sell it directly uh, to consumers uh, through a blockchain-based tokenized system where they pay for what they use, we're completely making it into a commodity, right? And we're replacing uh, basically the concept of oil wells and, and, and gas stations and the oil economy. So now you have uh, it uh, energy as a unit of kilowatt hour becoming a unit of currency without the um, centralized oil companies or government interference. And I think that's going to be very powerful for a new future. Very well said. And with that, we are out of time, but I wanted to thank the both of you for coming on. Shahal, thank you so much. Nassim, you are one of those guests that it was hard to keep up with. You are have a, you have a brilliant mind. Your technology is incredible. And I thank you so much for enlightening us with your intellect. Thank you. I appreciate very much. It's wonderful to be here with you. Absolutely. Guys, thank you so much, Shahal. Of course, it was always thank a pleasure you. to have you. Guys, that was our My Digital World segment brought to us by Tempest Network. And that was CEO Shahal Khan and his very good friend, Nassim Haramain from Taurus Tech. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Caldwell Soames Incorporated. Investing globally in transformative businesses like Original Digital Corporation, or ODC, ODC develops advanced consumer and commercial fintech solutions, such as OGPay, which will transform the way you manage your money. From sending and receiving money globally for free, paying for goods and services in person and online, pay bills, buy and sell digital currencies, all while earning interest. OGPay is easy to set up, FDIC insured, and your information is secured. Check out OGPay.com. We have returning contributor Paul Caldwell, chairman and CEO of Caldwell Soames. And today we are chatting with Vita Ridgway. She is focused on ODC digital initiatives inside entertainment, media, and communities. She is the co founder of University Music Entertainment, home of award winning multi platinum artists Drew Hill, Maya, and Cisco. Vita and her partner, Grammy nominated music producer Ron Lawrence, recently launched culturetech.io, a website that serves as the place where tech meets culture, an intersection of crypto, the metaverse, NFTs, blockchain, fintech, and all things Web3 for the creator economy. And today we are chatting about fintech social impact, cryptocurrency, and tokenization. Now, digital transformation has been introducing profound improvements across various sectors, especially in the case of digital payments. However, the growth of payment technology has also created noticeable threats for sensitive customer data. And as our data passes through various points when making digital payments, it becomes vulnerable. Therefore, 
tokenization blockchain combination is very much on the rise as a reliable approach for isolation of data in ecosystems. This is where you pay attention. This application of tokens has increased in the payments processing industry for storing credit card information without exposing the original data, meaning keeping our personal details safer than the traditional methods used in Web 1 and Web 2. And in addition, the use of tokenization in blockchain has been making news for prospects of converting tangible and intangible assets into digital tokens. So exactly what does the new age of tokens mean for the future of blockchain? Well, Blockchain and tokenization of assets aren't for every industry. However, several sectors like cannabis, fintech, and cloud computing are really embracing these transactions that now allow for essentially better proof of ownership. Now, you might confuse tokens with cryptocurrency, but the tokens are used for investment purposes to store value or to purchase, while cryptocurrencies are digital currencies used to facilitate transactions such as making and receiving payments along the blockchain. Now, the tokens represent real-world items using blockchain technology, and they're transferable once these are in the blockchain, just like cryptocurrency. And here to break it all down and what this all means for us regular people is my expert at hand, Paul Caldwell, and his really good friend, Vita Ridgeway. Welcome to the show, superstars. Hello. I'm going to start with you, Paul. So in, in recent headliners, and this is tying it all together, Visa is launching a new um, consulting and advisory service to advise its clients on crypto. And Visa is going to offer advice to financial institutions and retailers and firms to basically help them better understand the crypto ecosystem. Now, while the move doesn't directly affect consumers, it is further evidence that cryptocurrency is gaining more mainstream adoption within corporate America, which generally has a positive Positive influence on the value of investors' crypto holdings. But of course, given the current volatility in the market, it's kind of sometimes all up in the air. What do you say to this? And should we be proceeding with caution, Paul? Then I think I think it's always wise to proceed with caution um, when something is um, unclear. And I think that's been the case with cryptocurrencies. I think people generally do not understand tokens or tokenization of assets or tokenization of cash flows and businesses and things of that nature. Um, a lot of people jumped in, a lot of companies, I should say, jumped in, and it impacts a lot of people when big companies jump in on crypto. For example, Visa has been quite good at uh, allowing for crypto Visa cards, for example. So crypto backed Visa cards. In other words, I have a cryptocurrency account, I get a Visa card, um, uh, tied to that account. And when I go buy something, it debits it in my crypto. It does a back end conversion, back office conversion um, to fiat or maybe not, depending upon the customer settings, the configuration settings in the system for that particular customer. But the challenge is some of the some of the back end things, some of the some of the subsequent to the transaction transactions that can occur, things like returns and RMAs, return merchandise authorizations and what happens if crypto being as volatile as it is goes down and who eats the spread risk? Um, merchant services providers like Fiserv and others are, are quite um, uh, concerned a bit about this because there's a, there's a certain degree of financial risk there and at mass that can be significant and substantial. So tokenization and being able to, um, being able to tokenize a transaction is one thing from a PCI compliance point of view. Europe has, Europe has tokenized uh, transactions through um, their PCI compliance requirements. And it's a, D, DS3 is a law now on all systems in Europe. You have to code to DS3, which is a digital security protocol. Um, and if you don't, you can't do business uh, on an, on an e-commerce website, that's for sure, in Europe without it, or you're going to be in trouble. Um, as far as uh, tokenization of assets, NFTs, I think all of that is here to stay. But again, it's going to be uh, it's going to still evolve. It's not where it's going to be. I think we're back with crypto and NFTs and metaverse and megaverse and multiverse and all of that. I think we're back to where we were with Netscape Navigator many years ago. It owned the space. It was it was the one that was trending. And then Google came along and um, knocked everybody off of the search um, stool with, uh, with a better way, uh, uh, transformed how people thought about search. And I don't, that transformative um, solution hasn't shown up big in the marketplace yet, but it will. 
but it will. And you know, when you have Visa and even OG Pay, they're moving in the right direction. Uh, and there's beauty and power in simple mm -hmm. concepts like replacing sensitive data with tokens mm -hmm. to make digital payments more secure. Um, but Scratch beneath the service and powerful technologies, um, you know, Scratch beneath that service, they do enable tokens to do so much more than reduce payment fraud. So we are headed in the right direction. So much more though to uh, to be researched and to structure. Vida, I'm going to turn this to you uh, with your experience in the music industry. This is a very fitting question, a top popular trending question actually about smart contracts. And a smart contract really is a program that runs on the blockchain. Its code and data reside at a specific address on that blockchain. And NFTs are powered by smart contracts, which handle the transferability and verify the ownership. And this is one of the most attractive features of the technology. And getting paid as a creative is not always a straightforward process. All too often, up and coming musicians are stiffed on their royalties. And smart contracts are now mitigating those problems, ensuring that creators aren't cheated. Now, there's a, the, the original ERC-721 standard that led to the booming market of NFTs is now being revised to allow for really a more dynamic standard for paying out royalties, no matter the platform that mints the NFTs. Talk to me about the importance of advancement and how it's going to affect recording artists' bottom line. And can they use the OG Pay wallet to liquefy their monetizations into fiat currency? Um, absolutely. Yeah. So um, with regard to the music industry, um, NFTs, um, it's proving to be pretty disruptive. Um, as you may know uh, or have heard, of, uh, Snoop Dogg um, recently purchased um, Death Row Records and the catalog that goes along with it. And what he is doing with that is re-releasing -re and also releasing new music all as NFTs, um, which is really helping with um, adoption um, overall. And what this does is it allows for uh, the intermediaries to be eliminated for the most part and go direct to, um, well, we don't even say consumer anymore in this community, we say community. So it allows them to go direct to the community and build a community um, without having to have uh, middlemen like you know record companies involved. And because of, uh, like you said, on the blockchain, everything is recorded on the ledger, there is provenance, which means that you can know exactly where uh, it originated and then follow it all the way through the process, which also eliminates, like you said, um, the problem that has uh, arisen or that is prominent uh, with regard to royalties and collecting royalties uh, for artists. So uh, yes, much promise uh, in the NFT category for uh, musicians and artists. And it's beautiful because OG Pay can help them liquefy all that because for decades, musicians have not been equitably compensated for their music. And this has been particularly apparent in the music industry as reported by Fortune. The typical total revenue split is 50-50 with only 50% of revenue going to the entertainer and the rest shared among agents, lawyers, and distributors. And the reality is even grimmer when it comes to musicians who distribute their content via streaming services. Most of Spotify's top 0.8% of artists earn less than $50,000 and streaming revenue. So this is definitely paving the way. Um, Paul, I'm going to uh, turn this back to you because we're going to talk about the case used for blockchain tech in banking. Now, access to banking is an immense problem for several e-commerce companies. Regulations, uh, Regulation really and monopolies can prevent easy access to finance for small startups. And blockchain technology is helping solve the sector's problems by allowing them to bypass traditional banking and speed up transactions without compromising security. OG Pay is one of those platforms. Walk us through the different differences of the traditional payment platforms versus the hybrid ones that also incorporate blockchain technology. Sure, Zen, no, no worries. I, I think I want to mention something about smart contracts. In our firm, we believe um, that smart contracts is, is, um, is, is the next um, stomping grounds of, of innovation and transformation. Um, disruption, yes, Snoop Dogg does what Snoop Dogg does. That's a that's a simple concept that could, could create tremendous value. And it's the simplicity in that kind of concept that uses existing technology to make a big deal. You know, there's something called the Music Modernization Act. And the Music Modernization Act is being used by artists to reclaim the royalties. Once those royalties are reclaimed, then they can tokenize those royalty, the, those the, that content into a new context because they own their publishing, for example. Uh, they, they get it back from Warner Chapel, this kind of a thing. So that's that's a big 
that's a big thing happening in a simple way right now. But I think that's a big thing. Smart contracts aren't always as smart as they ought to be either. So the technologies that are going into developing new types of smart contract algorithms are uh, is significant, and they will be substantial. The um, OG Pay, for example, is is innovative. It's disruptive, but it's also transformative. Main thing, transformative because it transforms how people think about something as simple as how they use their money, just like Uber transforms something as simple as how people think about how they take a ride. And when you think about that and you start talking about making payments at a commercial level um, without all of the interference of the the rails, so to speak, um, they become unnecessary because if a company, if a business has a commercial wallet, a consumer merchant, uh, a consumer with a with a wallet can do a consumer to merchant transaction wallet to wallet without having to create heavy fees for the merchants without that merchant having to pay 2.99 percent for example so someone uses their visa card they don't have to use their visa card but so if you start at the wallet and work your way back to be able to accept credit cards as well one can imagine widgets being created on things like shopify where someone that creates a new store, a brand new store, could actually click that widget and add that payment functionality to their Shopify account. And that account would accept digital assets, cryptocurrencies, um, fiat currencies, and uh, wallet-to-wallet transactions, as well as credit cards, all in one um, widget. So these are these are the this, these are the directions. This is the direction of very proposed is, is in the marketplace. Yeah, yeah, kind of revolutionary. Okay, we have about a minute left, and I would like Vita to answer this question. So Vita, through community and strategic partnerships like OG Pay, um, partnerships can help reach the underserved. In fact, to reach people who aren't part of financial institutions, it actually takes a village. So we have to think about where the consumer has trust, and it may be the corner store down the street that they're using to access financial services, even if it's predatory. But with the tech we have now, like like OG Pay, we can bring services to where the trust uh, secured is is where the trust is secured in a responsible manner. So let's chat. Um, OG Pay is money management transformed. Why does this matter to the community? You have about a minute. Okay. Well, it matters to the community because OG Pay is not only talking the talk, but they're walking the walk, meaning putting boots on grounds, going into the community with a grassroots, get your hands dirty type of approach that really um, can impact a community in a meaningful way, helping them to gain access to financial tools um, that can better their lives for the long term and and, and also, you know, access to information and financial literacy, um, not only just with offering a service, but also providing a service. There you go. Well said. And that sums up another segment. We are out of time. Paul, thank you so much for coming on. It was such a pleasure having you on. Vita, what an incredible um, ability to just speak to you and get your perspective on the music industry and really where OG Pay is going. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. Thanks, so. Absolutely. Guys, you definitely have to check out Vita Ridgeway. Check out culturetech.io and make sure that you're checking out ogpay.com. That was our innovation and tech segment brought to you by Caldwell Soames with Chairman and CEO Paul Caldwell. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. We'll be right back after this. If you've missed out dining in New York City for the past year, it's time to visit the legendary Viche Cucina. Located in the heart of Midtown, Viche specializes in blending delicious northern Italian and American cuisine with dishes such as the incredible Taglioni lobster, ravioli masala, asobuco, and paparadelli al telefono, along with many other mouthwatering offerings. You deserve a great night out. Call Viche Cucina, 212-757-2600 or online at vichecucina.com. Well, that's a wrap, my dear friends. We are at the end of our date. Remember to join me right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York, every Saturday night from 9 to 10 p.m. Or go to 710WOR.iHeart.com forward slash a moment of zen. And remember, we're now on TV. Download the KP Media TV app on Roku, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, or Android, whatever tickles your fancy, or tune in at impact.kpmedia.tv and catch a moment of Zen on the Impact Live channel Sundays at 11 a.m. Eastern. All episodes are now available all demand. Thank you for listening to A Moment of Zen. Thanks again to all of our sponsors who make this show happen. It's been an absolute pleasure being your host. And remember, happiness is the only thing that multiplies when you share it.